Today we are learning English with Nicole Kidman and her new Netflix show The Perfect Couple. Nicole Kidman is one of those rare actresses who can completely transform herself for each role. Whether she's playing a woman trapped in an abusive relationship or a real-life author like Virginia Woolf, she brings a unique intensity to her characters. Did you know she's one of those few Australian actors to win an Oscar and speak with a flawless American accent in her roles? This is, he, he's a wonderful father. I mean, he's the best, the best. I couldn't think of a better one, really. Her versatility never fails to impress viewers. Flawless and versatility are among other advanced words that we included in a special deck of flashcards that come with this lesson. Practicing with them daily on our Real Life app is the easiest way to remember these words forever. If that sounds interesting to you, just click the link in the description below using your phone to start your vocabulary practice right after this lesson. And if you are new here, welcome aboard! Every week on this channel we create lessons just like this one to help you understand your favorite movies and TV series without getting lost, without missing the jokes and without subtitles. So hit that subscribe button and bell down below not to miss a single new lesson. Now let's watch the clip with the subtitles, then I'll explain all of the most important vocabulary, grammar and pronunciation, and then we'll watch the clip one more time to check your comprehension. Mm, no, it's not going to go back to the way it was. I'm not going back to the way I was because, really, I've been living a lie, haven't I? I mean, I'm far more colorful than that, aren't I? Well, it, was a, it was a turn of phrase. No, it was a threat, Tag. Oh. That was a threat. So, boys, gloves are off now. Your father and I didn't meet in a gallery opening. We met in a bar. What are you doing? What am I doing? I'm ripping the Band-Aid off. <laughs> Tom and I met in a bar. I worked in a bar. I um, I sometimes worked in a hotel. You should want to tell this story you find no, when your mother, she, yeah. where she oh, yeah. comes from. I want to tell this. There, uh -huh. there weren't a lot of opportunities, and so she had to work. She worked very hard to support herself. Oh, to and support what? my entire family, as I've always had to do, as I still do. But anyway, back to the point. Hmm. No, it's not going to go back to the way it was. I'm not going back to the way I was because, really, I've been living a lie, haven't I? I mean, I'm far more colorful than that, aren't I? When you live a lie, it's only a matter of time before it all comes to light. And that's exactly what happened here. Greer, Nicole Kidman's character, is fed up with pretending. Living a lie means hiding who you really are or covering up the truth about yourself or your family. In the scene, Greer shocks everybody, revealing that their so-called perfect couple was living a double life. It's another way of saying they were living a lie. Check out these other examples. No, no, no. It matters to me. It's like living a lie. I cannot live a lie. There will always be this big, fat elephant in the room with us. Spence, it's like you're living a double life. What makes you think I'm living a double life? I'm not going back to the way I was because, really, I've been living a lie, haven't I? I mean, I'm far more colorful than that, aren't I? People with colorful personalities are usually expressive, outgoing, and full of energy. What Greer says here might mean that, by living a lie, she had to hide parts of who she really was to fit the image of the perfect couple they created. Note that it's not common to use this word on its own. Usually you would hear a phrase, a colorful personality or a colorful character, like in this example from Inventing Anna. Would you like to leave a message? You know, I've met a lot of colorful characters in here. Murderers, hit women. Now listen to these sentences one more time. I've been living a lie, haven't I? I mean, I'm far more colorful than that, aren't I? How do we call those small questions at the end of the sentence? A 
They are called tag questions. We ask them when we seek confirmation or validation of what we said in the first part. In this case, she says she has been living a lie and by adding haven't I, she wants her husband to agree to that. The tag question follows the positive-negative pattern. If the main statement is positive, the tag is negative and vice versa. And as you can see in the second sentence, it also repeats the verb from the main part. I've been living a lie. The auxiliary verb is have, and we form a tag question with have, haven't I? I'm far more colorful than that. The verb is be, so we use be in the tag question, aren't I? It's a bit tricky with the verb to be, though. You can either use ain't I or aren't I, and both are correct. And did you notice the connected speech here? Listen to this sentence again. I've been living a lie, haven't I? I mean, I'm far more colorful than that, aren't I? We drop the T in the anti letters combination. Haven't I becomes haven't I. I've been living a lie, haven't I? It was, a, it was a turn of phrase. No, it was a threat tag. Oh. That was a threat. So, boys, gloves are off now. A turn of phrase is an expression or a specific choice of words. In the scene, Greer's husband just wants to make it clear that his words weren't meant literally, but were just a figure of speech. Earlier, he tried to calm her down by saying, everything's going to be fine and it's all going to go back to the way it was. So, if someone misunderstands what you said or takes your words too seriously, you can say it was just a turn of phrase to explain that you were just using a figure of speech. Well, you know what they say, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. You think we're wicked? No, what? <laughs> it's just a turn of phrase. <laughs> And there are so many turns of phrases, these idiomatic expressions that you can learn with us on our app. Every lesson includes an exclusive deck of flashcards featuring all the vocabulary that we've covered. By practicing just 10-15 minutes daily, you'll be able to transfer these new words from your short-term into a long-term memory. Plus, with the spaced repetition software on our app, you'll retain vocabulary more effectively by reviewing the words at carefully timed intervals, just when you're about to forget them. Because we know how frustrating that feels when you get a chance to practice your English speaking by having a conversation, a real conversation in English. But then you find yourself pausing frequently just because you're forgetting all the useful words you know. That sucks. I've been there myself. And let me tell you, this is exactly what the Real Life app can help you with. I highly recommend you check it out. The app is free to download. Just look for Real Life English in the App Store or Google Play, or simply click the link in the description below. It's free to get started, so go and download it now. It was a, it was a turn of phrase. No, it was a threat tag. Oh. That was a threat. So, boys, gloves are off now. The gloves are off or the gloves are coming off is an idiom that means that situation got serious and someone is no longer being polite or keeping their true feelings to themselves. Here she finally wants to let it all out, so gloves are coming off. This phrase comes from sports where removing the gloves signals that the fight is about to get much more intense or brutal. The gloves are off, pal! Come on! Let me see a little rat. Smite me, oh mighty smiter! Gloves are off now. Your father and I didn't meet in a gallery opening. We met in a bar. What are you doing? What am I doing? I'm ripping the band-aid off. <laughs> this is a band-aid. And when you rip it off, it's not the most pleasant feeling, right? So, to reap the band-aid is used as a metaphor for dealing with an unpleasant or difficult situation quickly. It might cause brief pain, but it helps avoid dragging out this discomfort. Hey, what are you doing? Ripping off the band-aid. And so she had to work. She worked 
very hard to support herself. Oh, to support my entire family, as I've always had to do, as I still do, but anyway, back to the point. In a conversation, uh, the phrase back to the point is used when someone wants to return to the main topic or focus of the discussion after getting distracted. In the scene, Greer is trying to get back to revealing the truth about her life. I was an escort. A very high-end escort. I had sex with men for money. My brother organized the clientele, and your father was one of those men. Fucking gross. Oh, my God. I didn't pay. <laughs> Come on, Tag. Well, the first time, technically, the first Yes, you, did he pay? I, yes. You, you did pay. Three I, times, three times. All right? And now I pay for everything. What, what does that matter? What the because fuck are you doing? This no, is no, no, no. I want them to keep filming. Please, please, text, write, do whatever you want, because I'm not living like this. I'm not living in fear of exposure anymore. Do you hear me? I'm not living with your goddamn mess. I'm not cleaning everything up for you. I'm done with your ego. I'm done with your bullshit. I am done. Do you hear me? Done. I'm not taking care of everything for everyone anymore. I'm done. I was an escort. A very high-end escort. I had sex with men for money. My brother organized the clientele, and your father was one of those men. Fucking gross. Oh, my God. An escort is usually someone hired to go with another person to social events, dinners, or outings. It doesn't always mean sexual services, though sometimes it can, depending on the situation. You may come across this word also in other contexts, like military or police escort, meaning the military or police accompany a person or a group of people, which is typically done to protect someone important, like a political leader or a witness. Barney, I'm not bringing a date, even if I wanted to, the thing's in two hours. So get an escort. By escort, you mean prostitute? Why not? Her brother then adds that Greer was a high-end escort. High-end refers to something luxurious, expensive, or serving wealthy or prestigious clients. They make safes here? Complex security systems. High-end, top of the line, very expensive. The ghost stole a safe? I had sex with men for money. My brother organized the clientele, and your father was one of those men. Fucking gross. Oh, my God. Clientele is just a fancy way of saying all the regular customers or clients of a business. For example, if a cafe has a loyal group of people who come in every day for coffee, those people are the cafe's clientele. Why would you ever question that? Well, the clientele here is mostly rich white people. Gross is disgusting. As we see in the clip, you will say gross when something you see or hear makes you feel uncomfortable, sick, or repelled. I didn't pay. <laughs> Come on, Tag. Well, the first time, technically, the first Yes, you did he pay? I, yes, you, you did pay. Three I, times, three times. In this sentence, you did pay. The verb did is used for emphasis. They want to make it clear that Greer's husband did pay, even though he said he didn't. So, instead of just saying, you paid three times, which sounds neutral, you did pay three times makes it stronger and highlights the fact that he actually paid multiple times. Please, please, text, write, do whatever you want, because I'm not living like this. I'm not living in fear of exposure anymore. Do you hear me? Exposure is when your private life, secrets or weaknesses are made public, often causing embarrassment or harm. Greer, being a famous writer, has always been careful about her reputation, up until this very moment. A group emailed to all her former students, checking up on them after moving away, just a concerned teacher reaching out. No risk of exposure. I'm not living with your goddamn mess. I'm not cleaning everything up for you. I'm done with your ego. I'm done with your bullshit. I am done. Do you hear me? Done. In this context, a mess refers to a situation that is chaotic or full of problems. 
goddamn is a strong swear word, so by using it she intensifies the sentence, showing how angry and frustrated she is with this way of living. She might already be dead. The whole reason you're in this goddamn mess is because we're not working together because you refuse to talk to me. I'm not living with your goddamn mess. I'm not cleaning everything up for you. I'm done with your ego. I'm done with your bullshit. I am done. Do you hear me? Done. So Greer is fed up with all the mess. She's done living a lie. And as you can guess, the phrase I'm done means you've reached the limit of your patience. You're emotionally exhausted. You can't go on like this anymore. You can say, I'm done with something or I'm done doing something. Both are correct and mean the same thing. But don't confuse it with the context of finishing a task. <laughs> For example, if you say, I'm almost done, it means you're nearly finished with your task. I can't do that to Abby. <laughs> and throw away our life together. So I am done being scared and I am done keeping secrets. So we're almost done, meaning we're almost finished with the lesson. Now it's time to test your comprehension. Watch the clip one more time without subtitles and answer the quiz questions that we prepared for you. Let's watch it. Hmm, no, it's not going to go back to the way it was. I'm not going back to the way I was because, really, I've been living a lie, haven't I? I mean, I'm far more colorful than that, aren't I? Mom, it, was a, it was a turn of phrase. No, it was a threat, Tag. Oh. That was a threat. So, boys, gloves are off now. Your father and I didn't meet in a gallery opening. Choose what best describes the idiom gloves are off. Someone is about to start a difficult physical task and they need to remove their gloves to have better control. A moment when someone gives up trying to be polite or gentle and is ready to be more aggressive or direct in a confrontation. A situation needs extra care, like putting on gloves to avoid making mistakes. And so she had to work. She worked very hard to support herself. Oh, to and support well. my entire family, as I've always had to do, as I still do. But anyway, back to the point. I was an escort. A very high-end escort. I had sex with men for money. My brother organized the clientele, and your father was one of those men. Fucking gross. Oh, my God. What does the word high-end mean? Located at the highest point in a building, like a top floor apartment, outdated or no longer in style, of superior quality, typically expensive and made for people who want the best. I didn't pay. <laughs> Come on, Tag. Well, the first time, technically, the first... Yes, you, did he pay? Tag. Yes, you, you did pay. Three tag. times, three times. All right? And now I pay for everything. What, what does that matter? What the because fuck are you doing? This no, is no, no, our no, I own. want them to keep filming. Please, please, text, write, do whatever you want, because I'm not living like this. I'm not living in fear of exposure anymore. Do you hear me? I'm not living with your goddamn mess. I'm not cleaning everything up for you. I'm done with your ego. I'm done with your bullshit. I am done. Do you hear me? Done. I'm not taking care of everything for everyone anymore. I'm done. What does exposure mean in the context of someone's private life? having to work outdoors, keeping personal information hidden, the risk of having personal secrets or private information revealed, being in the spotlight and admired by others. That's it for today. As always, I'll be super excited to see your comments with feedback and your suggestions for new lessons. 
Remember to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell down below to follow all of our new videos that will make your English learning fun, natural and convenient. And if you are looking for a lesson to watch next, check out this one. You know what's funny? When I saw your ad on Craigslist, I thought you were women. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Why would you think that? That's crazy. I mean, what? The, Schmidt wrote the ad. Oh, I guess it was something about the words he used. It was like, uh, like, sun soaked and beigey. Ah! <laughs> what are you doing? Wow. Mm -hmm. What about these? These look beigey to you? Sorry. I'm a trainer, so uh, it's kind of the house that Coach built right here. What are we looking at here? That's baby smooth. This, this is, is LLS. Cool.